Let's go to Genesis chapter number uh, one, just very quickly this morning. And again, it's just good to see everyone. <clears throat> Glad to have you with us this morning. And I'm going to follow on to where we were last week when we stopped, uh, started in on a series called Steward Shift and talking about how we can make adjustments in, in, in our personal stewardship of the things that God has given us responsibilities for. Genesis chapter number one, I'm going to read three verses. If you would stand with me just quickly. Uh, I will be a good steward of your time this morning and have you out of here with a good word. Anybody ready for the word of God? Yeah. All right, we're going to have you out of here, give you, a, give you a little shot in the arm and, and send you on about your way. All it takes is one shot. Just takes one word. Amen? Amen. So look at Genesis chapter number 1, verse 26. I'll read through 26 and 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion. Everybody say dominion. dominion. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, over all the earth, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth 27 so God created man in his own image in the image of God he created him male and female he created them everybody say them, them. again verse 27 so God created man in his own image in the image of God he created him male and female he created them verse 28 then God blessed them then God blessed them then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Father, we thank you <clears throat> that heaven and earth might pass away, but your word shall stand forever, Father. I thank you that we have eyes to see and ears to hear what your spirit is saying to the church. And Father, I thank you for challenging us, convicting us, and taking us to the next level, Father. That we would walk out your perfect plan here on the earth. You said you know you're intimately familiar with the thoughts and the plans that you have for us, Father God. They're good plans. Plans to prosper us, Father God. Plans to give us peace. Plans to grow us, to give us a hope and an expectation, Father. So this morning, God, we're gathered together, Father God, to pursue your plans. With persistence and with consistency, Father, we pursue the plan of God for our life. So we thank you for it, Father. We thank you that, uh, that you will speak through my vocal cords, think through my mind. Let it be none of me and all of you. I give you praise and glory for it now. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everyone said amen. amen. Let's make this confession together. Lift up your phone or lift up your Bible. Say this after me. This is my Bible. There are many like it, but this one is mine. There are many like it, but this one is mine. I can have what my Bible says I can have. I can be what my Bible says I can be, and I can do all that my Bible says I can do. And right now, and right now, and right now, in the name of Jesus, I'm ready to receive the incorruptible, the indestructible seed of the Word of God that will change my life forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. All right, so we're going to go into part two of stewardship. Again, uh, thank you all for being here today. Um, have a lot to share, but I think some things that we have to share are very timely, and some of this is going to come by way of just a little bit of follow-up from last week. And you know that as we began this last week, uh, we focused on uh, a steward shift, and we focused on it primarily from the perspective of money. We talked about the tithe, and we talked about uh, how the tithe belongs to God and how everything that we have belongs to God. Well, this morning I'm going to back up because although all those things are true, uh, there are gifts and talents and abilities uh, that may be dormant within you uh, that we need to address uh, in order for you to properly steward those things and then all these other things will be added unto you. Amen. So if you think about that in, the, in line with Matthew 6 and 33, when we say, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, if I could say that in layman's terms, what I'm saying is uh, go after the plan of God and go after the purpose of God for your life. And as you go after that, you're going after the kingdom of God. And then everything else that you need, have a want and a desire for, uh, the Bible says that all those things will be added to that's you. Right. Yeah. So that's what we're going to deal with for just a bit this morning, all right, as we launch into this teaching 
<clears throat> on stewardship. Sometimes we kind of, uh, I don't want to get the cart before the horse uh, because there, much, there might be much more that you need to talk about and that you might want to consider with regards to finances uh, if we were being a good steward of the gifts and the abilities that God has given us. Let me say that in a, in a plain, plain way so everybody can understand it. If I'm doing the will of God for my life, where the will of God is, the resources of God are. Amen. That makes sense? Yeah. And everything I've read in the Bible about our God, he doesn't have a desire to leave you destitute and without. If he owns the cattle on the thousand hills, uh, I don't think that he minds sparing one of those cattle for me. I think that's why he made me O positive. I'm a steak eater. I'm in line with the word. And, and God knows that I'm a great recipient of those cattle. I don't need a thousand. All I need is one. And honestly, you don't need a thousand, a thousand words. All you need is one. You need the one word. You need the direction from God to get your life on target. So that you're not asking the question, am I doing the right thing? God, what did you put me here for? That's what it's all about. Okay? I don't want you, uh, nor does God want you to hit 45, 50, 55, 60, and you're still asking the question, what in the world am I here for? All right. And maybe even a little more scary is that you stop asking the question whatsoever, uh, whatsoever, and you just go into just living and not pursuing the plan of God. I don't ask a question. God doesn't have a purpose for me. I'm going to just flounder through life. No, that's not true. God has a great plan for you. Well, I, can't, I, I need to get, get away from that. If you think about the God that hung the stars and the moons, think about the intricate details involved in creation itself. You can't tell me that God was not detailed enough that he didn't line out and plan and strategize the details concerning our lives. But it's us to us to pursue those, uh, up to us, excuse me, to pursue those. So um, this morning, for just a few moments, I really want to kind of take uh, a, a little delve into determining the focus of the heart. We're still talking about stewardship, uh, but I want to talk about determining the focus of the heart. The Bible says that, uh, um, that out of the heart, uh, the abundance out of, somebody help me out. Thank you. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What I was looking for, thank you all for being a good class. What I was looking for is to guard your heart for out of it flow the issues of life. That's good, though. You all know Bible. We were still good. It's all uh, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Um, so with regard to stewardship, stewardship is uh, drastically impacted based on the uh, position of our heart. Amen? And this is in, in every area. Turn off finance for just a moment. I don't, want, I don't want you to think about money when I say stewardship. Turn that off for just a moment. There are several areas that we need to become good stewards over. So, so turn that off, and, and it's going to help you out. So what we're going to do, the goal today, our goal, is to help you discover God's principles governing stewardship, stewardship and to shift your life from that being one of being self-focused to being God-focused. Right. Is the majority of my conversation about me? Or is the majority of my thinking and my conversation about how I can be a blessing to other people? Yeah, so this is what we're going to work on. So who's a steward? Who is a steward? What is a steward? Someone who protects or is responsible for money, property, etc., etc. A person whose job is to manage the land and property of another person. Think about it in this light. Think about being a manager. When you manage something, you're not the owner. You could be an owner manager, but if you are just the manager, you don't own uh, the company, you don't own the property, you are just uh, administering as you've been given direction by the CEO or by the owner. So what is stewardship? Stewardship is the activity or job of protecting. Gosh, let's just draw a little emphasis to that word this morning. The activity or job of protecting and being responsible for something. And I'm going to add to this. You're responsible for something that does not belong to you. Can I throw a real curveball uh, out there this morning? Your life doesn't belong to you. It's, it's been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. So not even the lives that we live, the breath that we breathe, none of these things belong to us. But our job is to protect and to manage these precious resources that belong to someone else. If I gave you the keys to my Corvette, and y'all hear me talk about that car all the time, and you know that it doesn't belong to you, would you run it down a gravel road at 75 miles per hour and do fishtails and do all that type of stuff? No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. 
Now, for the one that said yes, uh, God be with you, you can be dismissed from the service of the Lord. No, you wouldn't do that. Why? Because, number one, the property doesn't, it doesn't belong to you, and it's precious to me. How much more should we care about our lives and what we're doing as we're walking day to day? Because, number one, my life doesn't belong to me, and it's precious in the eyes of God. Oh, whoa, I'm going to do some work there. I, I need you to see yourself this way, that every breath that you take, every opportunity that you have is precious in the eyes of God Almighty. It's very precious. Man, think about it. God sacrificed Jesus to give you opportunities. Maybe we need to go back and teach on the principles, just the basic fact of the cross, that Jesus died my death so that I could live his life. Does that make sense to everyone? So stewardship is the activity or job of protecting and being responsible for something that doesn't belong to you. In the Greek, when you define the word steward, a steward is one who has been given a charge or commitment to govern the distribution of or the protecting of the interest of another. So think about it in the words that I just said. Uh, we have given, been given responsibility to steward this life that was given to us by God Almighty. Can you say amen to that? All right, so. Um, stewardship is about being given something that is of value and to keep and manage that thing that is of value. Think about the story that I just read with Adam and Eve out of Genesis chapter number one, uh, where God essentially has given them complete reign over the entire earth. So God created them, uh, God kind of showed them a few things, and then God did this wonderful thing, he blessed them. Everybody say, he blessed them. So watch this. Stewardship begins with recognition and the acknowledgement of the value of something. If you don't know the value of something, you'll treat it anyway. That's right. That's good. You stay. If you don't understand what it took to produce something, what it cost to purchase something, you'll treat it anyway. If we don't know the value of something, gosh, we treat it anyway. Look, think, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck on the cross. The ladies have, have gotten me there. The value of your life was the price paid by Jesus on the cross at Calvary. Amen. Come on, you all, that's expensive. Amen. If someone said, hey, give me, your, give me that timepiece, give me that watch, and that'll get everybody out of sin, I'll give you, I'll give you every watch that's in my closet. Yes, I'll give you every bracelet, every pair of shoes, every belt, every pocket square tie. I give you everything. But if you said sacrifice your son uh, so that you can save Restoration Church, my only begotten son, full of grace and full of truth, I'd be like, whoo. I, I don't know. I don't. That, that's my boy now. I, I, I love my son. I'm proud of him and, and, and all that. I don't. Uh, I Half these people don't even believe in me. They don't believe in, and they don't believe in you, and, and, and they don't believe in, in him, and I'm going to sacrifice him. I don't know if I could have done that. But God, without hesitation, before we made up our mind, sent Jesus to the cross to die for our sins to give us an opportunity. I'm trying to get you to understand a point that stewardship begins with recognition and the acknowledgement of the value of something. Repeat this with me, and I don't say this to be uh, narcissistic. I am valuable. Say it like you mean it. Say it one more time. I now I'm looking, I'm going to look away. Some of you, your posture is telling me that you don't believe what you just said. I am valuable. No, I don't want you to repeat it right now. I'm demonstrating something. I am valuable. I'm important. I've been called by God. I have a great responsibility. I have a wonderful family. I have a loving wife. I have a huge network of friends and associates. Do you see how my posture is reflecting what it is I believe? I am valuable. I'm important. I, I got big dreams. I'm, I'm going to go a long way in life. I'm trying to work on something. I'm just trying to work on a mentality for, for just a moment. Believe what God said about you. I'm, I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to jump ahead. I'll, I'll just go ahead and get there. Believe what, believe what God says about you. Do you know the importance of studying our Bible when it comes to stewardship? 
2 Timothy 2.15 says it this way. It says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs to not be ashamed, but rightfully dividing the word of truth. This is why it's important for you to study and understand the word of God. Because everything around you is always telling you the opposite of what it is God is telling you. It is. It's always telling you that you're not going to make it. You're going to fail. You're not going to win. You're not going to be successful. She's going to leave you. He's going to leave you. You're not going to get the house. You're not going to get the car. The car's going to break down. Your kids are going to rebuild. Your kids are not going to come home. Your grandmama's going to disown you. Your mama. It's all, all that stuff is always out there telling you the exact opposite of what God says about you. So the reason that I say it's important to study the word of God, as you are reading the Bible and studying the word of God, you are reading and studying about yourself. And as you read and study about yourself, here's what's going to happen. It's going to take your self-worth uh, from the pit up to the pinnacle, and you're going to begin to value your precious life given to you by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, and now you're ready to operate in good godly stewardship. Come on, come on, come on. Thank you, God. Man, so don't take a risk with God's property. Amen. Amen. Do you, you get what I'm saying? We're playing Russian roulette with God's property. And God has called us to stewardship. We are. We're playing Russian roulette with God's property. Wow, that's good. I might make it. I might not make it. I might do it. I might not do it. You, you, you're, you're not responsible for those decisions that you're making. Well, you are responsible for the decision, but those consequences and that sacrifice that you're about to make, you don't have the resources necessary to back that sacrifice. So we acknowledge the value of something. Three things I want you to write down that you need to acknowledge the value of. Number one, acknowledge the value of your gift. Wow. Wow. Have you ever thought about that, that you individually have a gift that was given for the earth? Yes, sir. Not too many amens there. Yes, sir. I, I like this. I, I watched what the, the ladies did with their encounter team. All of them had a different assignment, Right? But collectively, when all of those people came together and carried out their assignment, it was a blessing to other people. Yeah. Uh -huh. Your gift may be different from my gift, but it is just as necessary as my gift. Because collectively, we bless the world when we individually operate in our gifts. So the second thing that you need to value and acknowledge is relationships. Whoa, the way we steward relationships. <laughs> the way we either appreciate or the way we really don't give a flip about relationships. And I'm telling you that there are resources and a tremendous power made available to you through relationships. Through all relationships, if you're married, through your spousal relationship, through your relationship with family, through relationship on your job, through relationships with your church, your church leadership, relationships are important, and we need to exercise great stewardship over relationships. Yes, sir. And then the last area is our assignments. Now, maybe, right. maybe this, this, this talk is not familiar to you, and, and this is just my vein. It's just where the, the Lord has placed me uh, to help people drill into and own the fact that you have a God-given assignment. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Come on, yes, sir. Now, some of you may be like, well, no, I'm just working the nine to five and whatnot. That's okay. Get along with, with Jesus. Get along with God. And I promise you that he wants to speak to you about your assignment. Yes, sir. Because if he called Pastor Deanna to be a difference maker, he called Brother Eric to be a difference maker. He called Beverly to be a difference maker. Yes, he called everyone to be a difference maker. You have an assignment for your life. Yeah, you do. You have an assignment. This is stewardship 101. How can I say to God, I'm being a good steward. I don't know what my gift is. I don't know what relationships are. And I, I, I have no idea. I haven't even started to think about an assignment. How can I be a good steward? Now, get comfortable with this. It's okay if your assignment is different. All right? I hope I can make this plain. We need believers in every spectrum of the world. Education, government, uh, politics, athletics, you need them everywhere. That's the only way we can spread the kingdom of God. Where there's a dark place and we send you in, the, I quoted the scripture, at the entrance of thy word there's light. That's why we need to send you in all those areas. We don't need, until the congregation grows larger, we don't need 72 pastors on staff. 
So we don't need to say, I know what my gift, I know what my call, I know what my assignment is. I'm called to, to be the pastor. Well, okay, we'll get in line. There's 52 others of us vying for the same job. While there is 5 billion people that are unchurched in the world on your job, in your gym, at your club, in your business, at your organization, that are not being preached to. That's, that's, the, that's the pulpit. That, that's, the, that's the real, we fight for this pulpit, now the real pulpit is outside this building. <laughs> it's all right, it's okay. Yeah, you, man, I'm telling you, you could be making some difference on your job that would just be mind-blowing. Stop lining out your notes and whatnot and just live your life where you are and you will start changing the world person by person, day by day, right where you are. Amen? All right, so watch this. To exercise good stewardship, you must recognize what you have been blessed with. You can't exercise good stewardship until you recognize that you've been blessed. God said to Adam and Eve, he said, look, he formed them, he created them, and then what did he do? I'll say that one more time. He formed them, he created them, and then what did he do? One more time. He formed them, he created them, and then what did he do? When he blessed them, he saluted them, he commissioned them, he ordained them to go and be successful. He gave them everything they needed to be successful. Wow. So the first recognition that we must have is to recognize that we've been blessed. You know why preaching is so hard? Because people don't realize that they've been blessed. Blessed people, when you talk about them being blessed, they get loud and motivated. Their right toe starts to curl up. They wave their hands up in there. They say something, their mouth, they can't sit still. When you start talking about people being blessed, that agrees with them, and they respond to that. And I'm telling you, I'm going to say it until I'm blue in the face, that Jesus died to make you blessed people. You bless people, you. You got to recognize there's no stewardship where there's no acknowledgement of the fact that you've been blessed because you think you are nothing. You think you have nothing. You think you can't do anything. And that's not true. You are something. You have everything. And God has called you to big things. I'm not going to shout. We'll just keep on teaching. We're just going to hunker down and just keep plowing through it. Amen. We have to be. We got to learn to be diligent. Got to learn to be diligent. So here's what God does in Genesis chapter number 1, verse 26 through 28. God qualifies them. Remember the synopsis? He creates them. He blesses them. Uh, He qualifies them in verse 28 when he says that they're blessed. Now watch this. He gave them dominion and rulership over everything. Essentially, he gave them everything. When David years years later writes Psalm 24, and he says the earth is the the, the Lord's and the fullness thereof, He's basically articulating uh, that when God said to Adam and Eve, go and have dominion over everything, the earth and the fullness thereof is, was placed under Adam and Eve's dominion. Does that make sense to everyone? So he entrusted them, watch this, he entrusted stewardship of what God, what he had created. God entrusted stewardship of what he had created to man. He said, I've made this uh, this fancy, very detailed and sophisticated world, and I'm going to give stewardship of it to Adam and Eve. Look at your neighbor and say, they had it all. They wouldn't sing it, wouldn't Houston, didn't they almost have it all? They had it all. They had it all. God gave them everything. woo yeah. Go to Genesis chapter number two quickly. I'm about out of time. Genesis chapter number two. We're working on some stewardship this morning. Is it okay that we just take our time and teach? Yes. Amen. I don't, want, I don't want to hoop you out or anything of that nature, and, and that's good, but I'm just saying we, we, we need information. Yes. We need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So Genesis, oh, I love this. So Genesis 2, um, look at verse 15. I love this. Then the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend it and to keep it. I'll stop right there for the sake of time. So God creates Adam and Eve. Uh, God blesses Adam and Eve. Everybody say he blessed them. He blesses Adam and Eve. 
Now that they are blessed and they have acknowledged the blessing, now they're ready for their assignment. Yeah, he creates them, he blesses them, it's acknowledged, now they're ready for their assignment. We're getting the cart before the horse. We're trying to go after the assignment, and we haven't acknowledged who it is that God has created us to be. I'm blessed. I'm blessed in the areas to do what? I'm gifted. I'm gifted in the area to do what? If I don't know what it is I'm supposed to do, I don't know where it is I'm supposed to be. So I'm searching after this and going after this and going after that, and I haven't done enough of a, of a time with God where he can say, this is what I've called you to do. Does that make sense to everyone? So the principle that we learn from Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 through 17 is this, um, is that God aligns my assignment with my skill sets. Come on. Yes, sir. Ooh. He puts Adam and Eve in the garden because they have the ability to exercise good godly stewardship. He said, you're blessed. You can do this. Man, Adam was naming, he was naming animals and he hadn't been to biology 101. They didn't, have, they didn't have species and naming conventions or whatnot, and, and things were coming to Adam. But, but watch this. He was created in God's image and in God's likeness, and he was blessed. He operated on a supernatural level. Stuff started coming to Adam, and he started operating in his God-likeness. And stewardship, when we really get this thing right, it's about being positioned so that we are operating in our God-likeness. Oh, church, Hallelujah. Goodness gracious. So he puts them in the garden because they have the ability to exercise good stewardship. Our ability to exercise good stewardship over what we've been given is challenged when we're out of alignment with God. So we can't exercise good stewardship when we're not in alignment with God. How do you say that? I'll demonstrate it right here in the Bible. This is exactly what happens to Adam and Eve, right? So God blesses them, he commissions them, he places them in their place, in their assignment, and says, now be good stewards over the entire earth. Right. Now listen to me, you all. Quoted Psalms 24 and 1 for a reason. Adam and Eve had everything. They had everything that anyone could ever imagine, and a conversation with a person called, we'll just call him a serpent, a conversation with someone who did not have the truth, he had knowledge of the truth, but someone that did not have the truth changed the course of humanity. They had everything. The enemy convinced them that they did not have everything, and they gave away everything. Remember that I said stewardship is about protecting something that belongs to someone else. Remember that? And so their job was to manage and to protect uh, what belonged to God, to be diligent um, at taking care of what it was God had given them charge over. I'm going to wrap up. Adam and Eve owned nothing. Watch this. Everything they had, God gave them. God blessed them. Then he said, manage it and be fruitful. Adam and Eve owned nothing. Everything they had, God gave them. God blessed them. Then he said, manage it and be fruitful. Two more things. Stewardship is about honor. Everybody say honor. honor. Say it again. Say honor. honor. Yeah. There are essentially two things we've been given to steward that we are, we have a responsibility to honor God with. Two things. Here they are. Number one, your personal life. Your personal life. We honor God with the proper stewardship of our personal life. Can I flash back for a minute? Because you know I like to have a little fun in church. Now, I'm, uh, I'm 47, so I'm trying to think of my, my last 19, 20, so 27 years ago. 27 years ago was my last DJ gig. Y'all can laugh. You church people, y'all crack me up. Yes. I got saved through Jesus, man. Jesus forgives all that stuff. And I'm not saying that because you're a DJ that you're a bad person. I'm just saying that I wasn't walking in my assignment. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, tw so 20 years ago was my last DJ gig. And a couple of things that were not happening. It wasn't being profitable. It wasn't very effective because I was like going to renting VFW buildings. 
And by the time we got done with the cover charge and everybody got in, I mean, we were making no profit. I was coming out of my Hardy's paycheck to pay for the event. Yeah, and all that stuff, and then having to work overtime at Hardy's to get enough money to, you know, to rent some bigger speakers and all that kind of stuff. And nobody's life was being changed. It wasn't being changed for the good. I mean, it was being changed for the temporary. Right? But man, every now and then I'll get on Facebook and connect with some of my old friends that used to come to my parties. Now, I can't take all the blame for it, but let me just say it this way. Their life didn't turn out so good. See, I made the switch. I, I, I got to a point where I said, wait a minute, something's not, this is not going anywhere. I remember, I'll say this quickly, but I remember I was at a party somewhere and we was, you was, we was getting it on. I mean, everybody was dancing and whatnot. And, and we were dancing to a particular song and somebody said, oh, we can just dance to this song forever. And when they said that, I said, wait a minute now. Even at 20, I said, no, forever. That's, that's not, at some point in time, you got to spin out of this because there's a life that you're going to have to live. My, my point with all that is this, you all. Um, at 20 years ago, in that foolishness, had I stayed on that course, my life was not going to honor God. I wasn't exercising good stewardship because what I was doing and my habits were not honoring the Lord. Oh, you all are quiet. I must have a lot of DJs in the church this morning. And the reason I say that, people weren't being edified. They weren't being changed. They weren't growing as disciples of Christ. They weren't growing in God. No, I was leading them in self-destructive behaviors and habits. I was leading them. The life that Jesus died for, this big mouth silly guy from Mobley, Missouri, the life that Jesus purchased, I was throwing it away. I was not honoring God with my life. And if your life is not changing the world of another person, have a conversation with God. God, am I fully honoring you with my life? It's not just for the person that has a ministry credential to be a world changer. It's for every person that says, yes, I belong to Jesus Christ. So stewardship is about honor. We honor God with our personal life. The second thing that we honor God with, we honor God with our possessions. Proverbs 3, 9 through 10 says it this way. It says, honor the Lord with your possessions, with what you have, and with the first fruits of all of your increase. So your, bar- oh, I love the so. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Yeah. Look at, oh gosh, look at the clause. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all of your increase. Semicolon. And as a result of doing that, your barns are going to be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. So I honor God with my person, with my life, and then I honor him with my possession. Let me throw this out there. I believe that as we seek uh, God uh, from Matthew 6 and 33 and we find the will of God for our life and we are honoring God for, with our lives and we're honoring him and, 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 and building the kingdom and whatnot, that God's plan always is to increase your possessions. Because he sees our heart, and he knows that when my heart is one that wants to be a blessing to other people, now he says, okay, now they're ready to be a good steward, and now I can expand them because I'm not going to increase them and they just blow up. I'm going to increase them, and they're going to be a blessing to someone else. (laughs) Stand to your feet. I'm out of time. I started out by saying that stewardship is a matter of the heart. You can't really honor and worship God unless it comes from your heart. Whatever it is that we believe, we believe in our heart. And honestly, you all, what stewardship is, it's a test. It's a test of your heart. It's a test of where your heart is. So we must determine the focus of our heart. Is myself enthroned? Am I the king of my life? Am I only concerned about self-indulgent, what I can get for me? Am I protecting my own self-interest? Am I in fear that God is trying to take something from me? You know, next Sunday on Impact Sunday, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to participate in that. Because, you know, they, somebody, God, 
Pastor K, they're just after my money. Am I in fear that God is trying to take something from me? A self-enthroned heart said, it's all mine. And then a self-focused or a self-enthroned heart says, I trust what I can do. How do we know that we've arrived at the place of having a God-focused heart? God is on the throne. I'm only concerned about pleasing God. I'm concerned about protecting God's interest. God's interest is souls, it's people. It's the destitute, it's the brokenhearted, it's the hungry, it's the widow, it's the orphan, it's the sick, it's the prisoner. That's where God's interests are. Yeah. Faith that God loves you. This is how I know that I'm God-focused. I have faith that God loves me and he only desires the best for me. Gosh, I might stop right there. Do you believe that this morning? That God loves you? And, and, and if you don't, that's okay. I hope you'll keep coming back so that we can convince you of this. God loves you. He wants to bless you. He only has the best in mind for you. Man. Finally, everything that I have, here's how we know that our heart's in the right place. When our heart says that everything that I have belongs to God. And then lastly, I trust what God has done for me. I trust what God has done for me. It might seem like a lot. It's really not. It's simply this. It's simply trusting the God who believed in you enough that he allowed his son Jesus Christ to die for your sins, for your mistakes, for your hangups, all for you to have the opportunity to live an abundant life. And when I say an abundant life, I mean a life of purpose, a life of passion, a life of vision, and a life of focus. That's what God wants from you. Vision, power, focus. That's what he wants. That's what he wants for every single one of us. For us to understand that God's got a vision for my life. I've got a plan. I don't, I'm not just living haphazardly. I have a plan. I have a focus. That's what Jesus died for.